we had this node in Lynx, we kind of knew that some of this stuff was happening. We had no idea. I mean, even even the more kind of creative and conspiratorial of us did not have any idea how far it went. We knew they were doing some stuff. What the Snowden leak showed us was that the NSA was doing every single thing possible they could to invade our privacy. Like not just not just some of the things they could do, but literally they were making a list of every single every single security hole, every single possible attack you could use, and just going down it systematically, assigning people to it and budget to it, and just like you know, and 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 so now going forward, we know that that's their plan. We know that wherever there's a, a security hole, that the U.S. government is going to be exploiting it to to undermine people's privacy. So we have to close those holes. And um, at the level of like protecting a single individual from being a target, that's really hard. It might be impossible because we just don't know how to secure, you know, smartphones and computers at that level. There's always going to be a bug, and if you spend enough money, you'll find the next bug that nobody knows about, and you can exploit that to spy on people. But as far as defending large groups of people from bulk surveillance, like from you know, in terms of defending all of our, ourselves from getting spied on, it's a lot easier. Where um, you know, there's there's simple things that the services we use and that the, the apps we use can do to make it really, really, really hard for the NSA to do what they're doing when it comes to spying on all of us. Many of our previous campaigns in the past were all about, like, call your congressman and stuff like that. This one is about uh, encouraging and empowering and inspiring people to take some step if they're a software developer, if, they're, if they have uh, a tech product or software product they're putting out, or if they're just an individual who, who uses tech all the time to take some step to protect their turf from NSA spying. And there's so many things you can do. It's just it's enough to just look at the list of ways in the Snowden docs that, that they're currently spying on people and say, oh, yep, they're doing this, we gotta close that. Or they're doing this, we gotta fix that. Go down that list um, and, and really, you know, it's a lot of work and it's gonna take a lot of time, but if we take the first step, we start down that road, and, 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 and we can, if we continue down that road for, uh, for long enough, we'll be in a place where the NSA no longer has this power. When the leaks first happened, it seemed like, it seems like the company's denials were definitely hollow, that they, were, that they were lying, that they were parsing words in order to say that, you know, in order to avoid saying that they were collaborating in some way. But I think, at least for most of them, and there's a couple exceptions along the way, now my perspective is that most of what the NSA was doing actually was hacking those companies. Um, and sometimes they were hacking those companies in ways that were just taking advantage of the company's negligence. So like, you know, if companies are sending data between their data centers totally insecure, or if they're sending emails between other email servers totally insecure, what do they expect is going to happen? You know, that uh, it's, it's really, we've known for a while that the NSA was setting up these, this kind of position on the net, basic network infrastructure. So I think it, you know, to some extent that was the negligence, especially when you have like, you know, Yahoo not having any SSL, any secure communication between itself and its users for, for years. They're just adding it now. Okay, Cupid still hasn't added it. I mean, that's just negligent. So there was some negligence, but my take now is that most of what the NSA is doing is, was essentially like looking at those companies as adversaries, the same way they look at us as adversaries and trying to just get over on them as, as, as best they could. And, um, and I think in most cases the companies were pretty much dealing with that with the NSA knowingly through the front door. You know, they get these these warrants, incoming requests for data, and they respond to them. Um, they knew they were doing that, but that's, you know, the stuff in the Snowden docs was way beyond that, and I'm pretty sure at this point that was hacking. Now, I'm not, you know, we don't know this for sure yet, but that's, as someone who's accompanied the, the process, and, and initially was very, very skeptical of, of the company's statements, that's, that's what I feel. Um, there was one big exception, which is Microsoft and Skype, where it seems like Microsoft deliberately went out of their way, even in advance of getting a court order to work with the NSA to make Skype easier to spy on. And that's shameful. Um, and I don't think anyone should trust should trust Microsoft with their communication tools in the future after after the, the and we, you know, we have the docs that they did this um, after that, that being revealed. Um, and uh, there's also the scandal with RSA, which is another notable one, where RSA collaborated with the NSA for money effectively undermining uh, basic encryption tools for everyone. Um, but apart from those two examples, most of what we've seen has been hacking. The thing to remember is that communication between individuals is extremely important and extremely valuable. It's valuable whether you're a company like Facebook, it's valuable whether, you know, if you're the NSA, it's valuable if you're us. I mean, our communication with each other is valuable to us. So when you think about the value of that in aggregate across mil millions, tens of millions, reaching billions of people, I, I mean, it's, it's important stuff. And so 
you know, I think the values of some of these in some of these acquisitions reflects the fact that it's important and it's valuable, just as much as it reflects, you know, as the fact that the NSA is trying to get access to this stuff represents the fact that it's or reflects the fact that it's important and valuable. You know what I mean? So I, I think that in some ways we might be seeing two things that are correlating, but not necessarily causal. They're both just a reflection of how important this new medium is, and everybody's trying to get a piece of the future of of the communication network of the planet because that's what, that's what we're building here and that's what's at stake. Um, you know, what I, my hope is that is that the individual users of those technologies have a shape, have a role and in, in some power over how all that stuff shakes out. And that's what that's what my work and you know our work as an organization has been about. Um, you know, I, some people think maybe the Skype acquisition by eBay back in the day from a company that was not based in the U.S. and that the American government had very little leverage over, and it was actually doing a really thorough job of, of encrypting communications between users. That that might have had something to do with um, with American national security interests, I wouldn't put it past him. Well, the direction that I that I hope we're going in at some point is, you know, we have we have the banner or the, the like standard set by free software, free and open source software, where the, the code is written by by volunteers um, or sometimes by companies, but the but it's out there for anyone to review, for anyone to build on, and you get these user communities developing it. No single person ends up controlling the direction that it takes. And it's a pretty sustainable model for building software. I mean, Mozilla Firefox is a great example of something that's out there that's free and open source that, that technically isn't really controlled by any single one organization. Um, and if one, any, if Mozilla, as stewards of it, had ever ended up doing something that its users didn't like, people would take that product and fork it and take it in their own direction. So what my hope is that more and more, increasingly, of our basic communication infrastructure, as these tools stabilize, will start to become free and open source. Um, you know, the Android operating system, as much as Google attempts to kind of manipulate it and close it, is another example of something that, that gives users that and, and uh, hardware makers that guarantee. Um, I, I think that's the direction we want to be heading in. Now, at the same time, there's so much value, you know, there's so much money you can make building a tool that isn't built like that and, you know, owning the users and selling their users to another company that we're going to see this kind of, these patterns and we're just going to have to work with that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, 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 the point we sh hopefully we'll get to someday is that our basic communication tools will be, will be free and open source. We know that they're not spying on us. We know how they work and so that we know that we can take them in another direction if the people who are stewards of them start being bad stewards. I mean, the way I see this is we need to fight for, for the, we need to give internet users and small organizations in this space, including startups, the power to fight for the kind of ecosystem they want to see and to, and to fight for their values. Um, because that's where you get, I mean, ultimately, like, you know, 10 years ago, no one, there, there were these tech policy battles sometimes, questions over a law or over the direction that a certain product or, or, or a certain technology would take. But, you know, to the general public, everybody just didn't care. Now everybody cares because everybody uses this stuff all the time. And that means we have an opportunity to, by informing all these, you know, all the, the billions of people in the world that are going to be using these tools about these questions of power that underlie them, and by giving them moments to come together and take control and kind of take the reins and guide things in, direction, in the direction that they want to see, I think we can ensure that, that how this plays out is, not, um, is, is fundamentally so much more beneficial to humanity than detrimental. I mean, that's the question, really. We're benefiting from this stuff every day. It's, it's, Technology is giving us so much power to change the world around us and make it a better place. And, and we, need to, we need to preserve that. That's something we need to preserve and build on. Um, and there is this dark side, but I think if we, if, if we give individuals the power to, to guide the development of technology, we can really minimize the dark side. Because I, I believe ultimately people do have, have values and principles that they build their lives around. And it's, when, you know, when prompted, it's pretty easy for them to see how those relate to the tools they use um, in the right kind of moment and with the right kind of explanation. And that can be an extremely powerful force. I mean, the first thing we did as an organization was organize the first big protest to, to stop SOPA, the internet censorship bill. And everybody thought that law was going to pass because that's always the way it had happened. You know, lobbyists just push that stuff through Congress. The most powerful, one of the most powerful lobbies, the motion picture lobby, the drug lobby, just pushing that stuff through Congress over anyone's opposition. And, and this time, at that time, it didn't happen because we were able to organize a massive number of people to call their members of Congress, intervene, and stop it.